Hello, everybody. I am so happy once again that you've chosen to join us. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again, we come asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. Father, we ask that you would speak to us individually and collectively. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so we are on, of course, article number 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin, to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're continuing today with Galatians, the third chapter, verses 19 through 25. And this is the NIV version, and which is what I use, uh, will probably use most of the time unless I state otherwise. Galatians, the third chapter, verses 19 through 25. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that, now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. <clears throat> so let's start today with the question in our text. What then was the purpose of the law? The why behind this question uh, can be found in the verses above verse 19. And once again, uh, remember the reason for which Paul was writing the letter in the first place. Remember, he was trying to dispel the false teachings of the Judaizers who were teaching that the Gentiles had to be, in essence, they had to become Jews in order to be saved. According to them, they had to be circumcised and, and then obey the laws and the rituals and, and all that kind of stuff of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant covenant. So Paul in <clears throat> previous verses and really throughout the book stresses that promises to Abraham did not come through the law. Abraham by faith believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And Paul is stressing that the promises to Abraham has not changed. And the promises came 430 years before the law and, and that the law did not make the promises null and void. It would be great if you read the whole letter, but at least read chapters one through three. And then if you do that, you have read half the book. So why not finish in the remaining three chapters? So Paul was putting so much emphasis <clears throat> on the promises that was made to Abraham and how the law could in no way bring righteousness. And, and so therefore he figured that the natural progression of his readers was to ask the question, because, you know, if Paul is going on saying the law, this, the law, that, and, and, and then, you know, it, the natural progression uh, was for the reader to say, just what was the purpose of the law? So, Paul asked, asked the question because he knew that the readers would also ask the question. And, and he not only asked the question, but he gives the an answer. And, and notice that 
like a lawyer, a skilled lawyer, he chooses his words carefully so as to continue making the point, making the point that he's making. He, he says, it meaning the law was added, which means that it did not do away with the promise. It was added. He says it was added for a specific reason and for a specific time. The reason it was added was because of transgressions. And the time was until the seed to whom the promises referred had come. So the question could be asked, what is the promise and to whom was it given? To which I will say, I'm glad you asked. So the promise was given to Abraham and it can be found in Genesis, the 12th chapter, verses one through three. Again, the NIV version. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will bless your name. I, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people of the earth, all the people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham's story begins with a command and a promise from God. The command is to separate himself from his kinfolk and those around him. Now, you know me, put a pen right there because I want to talk about that for a minute. Think about that. That's hard. You know, God tells Abraham to separate himself from his kinfolk and those around him. I, you know, that's hard. I, I think at one time or another, we've all wished we could just separate ourselves physically from the folk around us. But the reality is we soon get over it. And most of us just need some temporary space. Not, not a pack up, turn off the lights, no forwarding address, see you later, I'm out of here kind of thing. No, you know, but that is what God is asking Abraham to do. Pack up and leave without a forwarding address. The reality is that is hard. And yet, that is what God is asking Abraham to do. On the front end, it can feel as though God is asking you or, or to do some hard things, asking us to do some hard things. But the blessing is in the actual doing. And such is the case with Abraham. A man that, <clears throat> that up until this time was an idol God worshiper, and Joshua said in the 24th chapter of Joshua, verses two and three, he says to all, Joshua says to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshiped other gods. Have you ever paid attention to how God orchestrated things to, to get Abraham and Sarah out of the family, per se, you know, to, to move them and, and get them in a, in, a, in a spot where he wanted them. Now, even though you hear me in this lesson, I interchange between Abram and Abraham, uh, when God called him, his name was Abram and Sarah's name was Sarah. So I said that. So when I say Abraham and it's not time to say Abraham, then we're okay. Uh, so, but God's plan is by calling Abraham or Abram is to start a nation. And, and the key people would be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But he first has to get Abraham away from his family, away from his folk, because God wanted to do something special in Abraham. He wanted to start a nation with Abraham, not his folk, but Abraham. And so in Genesis, 
the 11th chapter, verse 27, uh, God is working this thing. He is working, of course, in the whole Bible, but our focus is on him working where, where Terah comes in on the scene. So and Terah is Abraham's father. From start to finish, it's God's amazing grace working his purpose. And, and I don't know about you, but I have a, you know, I always knew that Terah was, you know, I knew that Terah was Abraham's father and, 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 you know, and he had three sons and, you know, and, and I know all that, but I, I haven't just actually focused on the whole thing. You know, so often we focus on just Abraham leaving and miss how Terah played a part. And how God was a conductor in this whole thing. God is 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 conducting the whole thing. It, it may look like they are in charge, but really the reality is God is in charge. And it's the same way in our lives. It may look like we're doing this and that, but the reality is, is that God is in control. He's the conductor. So Terah, <clears throat> Abraham's father, has three sons. Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran dies, but, and I didn't know this one either, but has at least three children. And, and the Bible mentions Lot, Micah, or Milcah, and Iscah. And, and so Abraham marries his half-sister, Sarah, and Nahor marries his niece, Milcah. Terah, for whatever reasons, decided to leave his native land, which is the Ur of the Chaldeans, and go to Canaan. Maybe Abraham told his father of his message from God, and, and Terah decided that he was going to go too. So he, Terah, uh, being the father, it, it appears that he kind of took charge and decided to leave Ur of Chaldean also. And I say that because of what Stephen said in Acts, the seventh chapter, verse two through four. He says, Stephen says, starting with verse six, he says, to this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia. Now, Mesopotamia is, that is, or the Ur of Chaldeans, that's part of Mesopotamia. Before he lived in Haran, leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, meaning his father went with him, after the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. So Nahor must have decided not to go with him because he only took Abram, Sarah, and Lot. And, and, and just as a side note, remember Nahor comes back into the picture when Abram sends his servant to Nahor for a wife for Isaac. So Nahor is not out of the picture. But notice the hand of God. His purpose is with a man and his wife. The man being Abraham or Abram and the wife being Sarah or Sarah. And from them, his purpose is to build a family. From that family, he would build a nation. And from that nation, God would bless all nations of the earth, including us. But right now, there's more than Abraham or more than Abram and Sarah. There is Terah and Lot alone for the journey. Now, look at God work this thing out. Without Abraham having to do anything, God is in charge of our destiny. He, he's in the background. God is in the background doing a thousand and one things that we have no idea he's doing, but God is working it out. He's getting us to the place where he wants us to be. So, Terah sets out to go all the way to Canaan. He sets out to go to Canaan. 
but he only went as far as Haran, which is about five to 600 miles north of Ur. And he got there and he stopped. Now, why he stopped? I don't know. Maybe he was too old for the journey. Maybe he just got tired. Maybe he liked Haran. I don't know. But he stopped and he didn't go all the way to Canaan. And you can also look at the fact that God didn't call him to go to Canaan. He called Abraham and Sarah and the promise was not to Terah. So, so God is, like again, in the background, working things out unbeknown to Abraham. That tells me that folk can't just insert themselves into what God has for me unless God approves of it. What God has for me is for me. And, and no amount of manipulating from outside folk or sources is going to change that. God has a plan. And God worked his plan. It, it was God's plan that Abraham and Sarah follow him without their family. He said, leave your family. Don't bring them along. But notice how God's plan has time built in it. Terah was 205 years old when he died. So the death of Terah left them only now with Lot. Abraham's nephew, uh, you know, he was the son of Haran. But God's plan, remember, is just for Abraham and Sarah, and it has not changed. God didn't say, leave your kinfolk, but bring Lot with you. And, and so God's plan has not changed. And, 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 and so Lot was not part of the plan. And we know the story. And if not, you should read your Bible. Lot who had a bent toward worldly things, uh, toward worldliness, eventually settled in the wicked city of Sodom, which put Abraham exactly where God wanted him. Just Abraham and Sarah and a promise from God. God has a way of getting us exactly where he wants us to be. Don't ever think that your messes and your missteps and, and, and your shortcomings will interfere with God's plan for you. God is sovereign, which means he rules. His rule is absolute, meaning that you and me and nobody else can cause God's plan to fail. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but God worked through 42 super messed up generations to bring the world a savior. Your stuff, my stuff is small compared to going on the goings on of the folk in those 42 generations. In fact, our story can be found somewhere in the midst of their stories. That's why their stories are recorded, because we can find ourselves in them. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, verse 9 and 10, he says, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. So your stuff ain't new. My stuff ain't new. It's been before. It has happened before. Somewhere in those 42 generations, my stuff is right there. My answer could be there. So, so nothing new has happened under the sun. Verse 10 says, is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. No. And Solomon also says to everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under the heavens. And right now for this season, the time for this purpose is to say goodbye. Loved ones, thank you for joining us today. Love you, stay safe and be blessed. And until we come back again, see ya. Bye-bye.